Keisha sat on the couch in her new flat. Having put Toby to bed, she could have a bit of me time now, and so sprawled out on the plush three-seater and relaxed in front of the TV, remote control in hand. She loved spending time with her son after school each day, helping him with his homework, feeding him, hearing all about his stories from school. Keisha also loved time away from the exuberant energy of five-year-old Toby, who always seemed to be running at a hundred miles per hour and leaving her fully drained by the end of the night. Being a single parent was a full-time job in itself, and it was a real challenge to keep everything in order so that Keisha could get enough sleep for herself for her busy work day ahead of her the next day. Flicking through channels, hoping to find a good movie so she could settle down, it landed on Channel 9 and seemed to get stuck there. Either the remote control had a fault or the TV set and she was unable to pass this barrier. It didn't appear to be anything that would interest her. Couples hunting for their dream home or some such dime a dozen TV show. So she forced quit, switched off the TV by the mains. This was priceless advice Keisha had retained from the few times she had to call the IT department at work who would tend to begin their consultation with, have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? It usually worked. This time, no. Still unable to change the channel, not even manually on the TV, she fretted, then surrendered. What was this program about anyway? That blank was soon filled in by the narrator's voice. And now, an update from the case we reported on last week, in which a young lady and her young daughter were being harassed by their upstairs neighbour. Keisha gasped. She took more keen interest and turned up the volume with the remote, so distracted by her shock that she didn't even realise the remote control was now working again. The narrator went on. The young mother complained to her landlord that her upstairs neighbour did not have his hardwood floor carpeted and had no consideration when dropping things and moving about heavy objects above her. When her neighbour became aware of her complaint, the noise seemed to get worse. It was as if her complaint about his lack of consideration made him angry and brought out some really malevolent, beastly behaviour from him. From that moment on, her upstairs neighbour seemed to have a vendetta against the poor mum, following her around the flat with his heavy footsteps, violently banging the floor above her at all times of the day and night, dragging furniture noisily across his floor to wake her and her daughter up in the middle of the night. Sharon and her three-year-old daughter, Shana, felt like they were under siege in their own home. It was uncomfortable for Keisha to watch. Too close to home. Too close to the home she just left. In fact, the reason she moved from her last address and was now sitting here in the living room of her new flat was because Keisha and her son had an upstairs neighbour experience a lot like this one. It sent a shiver up her spine, remembering how creepy it was to be woken up in her nighty by the sound of her ageing male neighbour huffing and puffing wildly above her. He said he was doing his prayers, but to Keisha and everyone else who could hear, it sounded more like the impotence of a distressed dying animal pleading to be put out of its misery. Not exactly the kind of thing you want your five-year-old son waking up to. Toby was scared of that man. Then later, he developed the feeling that he had to be brave and protect his mother from this man's abuse. When it first started, similarly, after Keisha complaining that he showed no care, thoughtlessly dropping things on the floor and moving things around constantly, banging away as if he had no care at all how it sounded below. Toby would run into his mother's room, scared, out of his wits, sometimes crying, asking to sleep in her bed. As time went on though, without a man in the house, Toby felt that he should take the role of protector. He started having temper fits and shouting up to the ceiling 
when the man would start his ungodly noises. To this, the man would laugh or scream out something incomprehensible as if some strange language from the Bible but said in a very aggressive and combative way. This would shut Toby up eventually, making him cower and lay down, curl up in a ball on the floor. Keisha hated to see her son like this. She would try to hold and reassure him, but he would push her away, feeling conflicted for not being able to protect his mother. If only she could get through to the man upstairs, make him understand the effects that his actions were having on her and her son. She wrote letters to him asking him to stop, to consider her child's well-being. But this, and anything else she tried, only seemed to make the man even more obnoxious and intimidating. Keisha decided against approaching him after the first time she tried and was met with a fierce look in his eyes as if he wanted to kill her, followed by a murderously aggressive angry rant in the corridor, condemning her and her son as evil. He obviously wasn't well. The landlord did little, and very slowly. She was already busy enough as a mum, with her part-time admin job as well, and now found herself chasing down the landlord to pressure him to do something about the daily harassment from her neighbour, calling the police and being told to go back to her landlord. Soon, Toby's mood was radically altered. The bright, exuberant little boy became aloof and morose. He began performing poorly at school and wetting his pants, although he had overcome potty training a long time ago. He would visibly shake now most of the time, tremble. It was around this time that their upstairs neighbour eased away from his nonsensical ramblings and began screaming at them words they could understand. Always the same words, said in the same harsh tone, like a severe telling off, a condemnation of the worst sort, said in a booming voice, which seemed to shake the whole structure of the building. These words were, You are very evil. Ironically said in a very evil sounding voice. What kind of a man in his right mind would think this type of behaviour okay. That was just it. He wasn't in his right mind, and so there was no reasoning with him. Even her inadequate landlord had to agree that the man was some kind of a religious maniac, but that his hands were tied. As long as he didn't actually touch her or her son, he seemed to be free to do as he pleased without consequence. Apparently, the man had certain rights because of his severe psychosis, and that's why it wasn't so easy to evict him. Keisha was sure her neighbour was aware of this, and enjoyed the apparent advantage it gave him. Keisha's attention was brought back from inside herself to the world around her. The TV programme she had been watching, Neighbours from Hell, was finishing now. She must have gone off into a daydream that lasted all of 15 to 20 minutes. As the last of the credits scrolled up the screen, the advert break began. Keisha smiled. She felt a sense of closure. She felt no need to get back at this man for his terrible behaviour. Keisha was just happy that she and her son were now far away from him. Just before she moved apartment, his noise became unbearable. He was shouting his head off all the time, as if he was completely out of control, going on about evil and devils. What a bad memory. What a truly evil man. The police would come and talk to him, warn him, but he'd just leave it a few days and go back to his unruly, savage behaviour all over again. There was something violent in his voice, as if he meant to harm Keisha and her son. She would never forget how that made her feel. That's when she knew she had to move. Either this man was going to end up striking her, or one day she would strike him. She would have to, 
Her duty as a mother necessitated it, but she really didn't want it to come to that. And so she left. Moved into her mum's at first. Keisha and her mum were not close, but the man's domineering, destructive behaviour was so serious that mother and daughter were temporarily able to reconcile their differences. She spent some time in counselling to deal with the fear and all the anger that she had to suppress so as not to take it out on her son or let it interfere with her mental attitude in her job. It was hard, but she got there. Being away from him was the main thing. Every day away from him and his beastly violent noise was a day she felt more healed, more centred. Toby was disturbed for a lot longer than his mother. So young at the time, only five. He really wasn't equipped to deal with the toxic aggression of this lunatic neighbour, mentally, physically or emotionally. For a while, he would struggle with anger. His temper fits became more explosive and frequent. He hit other children in the playground and then the next moment, He'd be crying his eyes out. Poor boy. That man is like a scourge in the human race and he doesn't even know it, Keisha thought to herself, so concerned about her son at the time. I bet he's still carrying on the same way with someone else right now. He didn't seem like the kind of man who could learn, only the type to be stubborn and try to dominate people. Some poor woman or man is having to endure the same thing now that she once had to. All that chanting, condemning, cursing and wailing at three in the morning that put her bright cheerful child into therapy as a nervous wreck. And all in the name of Jesus. What a world. Keisha felt somewhat guilty for leaving without seeing to it that the man was either evicted or hospitalised, whichever was best for him. Knowing that by not confronting him herself, she'd be leaving him for another to have to deal with. Pity the poor soul in that predicament. Keisha had her son though, and this consideration eclipsed all else. She put 100% into healing Toby after their long ordeal. As tragic as the memory was, it could have been worse, and it did have its saving graces. Keisha turned to God and is now involved in outreach, helping vulnerable people in the community. Helping others has helped her to help herself, to get back on her feet, make new friends in her area. The confidence she's gained, she's given to Toby, through her prayers, her love, her patience the late nights reassuring him after bad dreams, and it has worked. Toby is doing much better now. He still has bad dreams. It's hard to get that kind of thing out of your head, especially for a small child. But he's doing better at school now, making new friends, and he's not hitting other children as much as he was before. One of the older ladies who attended the same temple Keisha now went to, would say to Toby when he looked as if he was about to have another attack of anger, Be careful, child. You become what you hate. Keisha understood the wisdom of these words in the form of her son and so embraced him in love and light. Real love and light. Not rules and regulations, punishments and condemnations, which seem to be the religion of the man upstairs, but acceptance, understanding, tolerance and unconditional love. She made peace with the past and was now ready to move on. Keisha chose not to hold on to hate for this man knowing just how dangerous that can be, but prayed for him instead. She prayed that one day he would find peace and overcome the need in him to dominate other people. She prayed that one day he would really come to know God as she had. And she couldn't help it, but that small part of ego that was still left inside her 
prayed that one day someone would treat him exactly the same way he had treated them.